my pleasure today to introduce uh, Dr. Randall Jones. As I mentioned, Dr. Jones will be speaking on the Sorbian language in Germany. Uh, he has a PhD from Princeton University and is well known across campus, uh, currently serving as associate chair of the Department of German, Germanic and Slavic Languages, but uh, also as a professor of German, dean of the College of Humanities, associate professor of German, and director of the Humanities Research Center. Uh, his vita is filled with many impressive publications, articles, presentations. Uh, we are grateful to have him with us today, again, speaking on the Sorbian language in Germany, a mother tongue with no fatherland. Dr. Jones. Thank you. I should start out perhaps with two disclaimers. The one is that I'm not all those things at the same time. Most of those are in my past. And secondly, I, this may come as a surprise to you, but I don't know Sorbian. I'm not an expert on the Sorbian language. My area is German and Germanic linguistics. But because the Sorbian speakers are in Germany, it's of interest to me because I am, I've done a lot of work recently with uh, social linguistic aspects of languages. And uh, because of the fact that there is this minority group in Germany, it's of interest uh, as well as German as a minority language in other areas. Let's see if this works now. There we go. Mm -hmm. I think it, it just it just advanced. In the extreme eastern area of modern Germany, straddling the states of Saxony and Brandenburg, right over through here, there exists a small community of approximately 60,000 Slavic people known as the Sorbs. These are not people who migrated here centuries ago from another part of Eastern Europe, nor are the asylum seekers who have recently fled their homeland for a better life. They have been where they are now for approximately 1,500 years. Indeed, they arrived before the German speakers did. They are an interesting people who have managed to maintain their linguistic and cultural identity against major odds. Who are they and where do they come from? Do they stand out among their German neighbors or are they reclusive and keep it themselves? What is interesting about their way of life and what is their future? In the short time I have today, I will attempt to address as best I can these and other issues and make you better acquainted with the fascinating culture that time seems to have forgotten. In modern Europe, there are numerous countries in which more than one language is spoken. As a second or even third national language, an official language used in specific situations, or a minority language. Among the minority languages, for example, Basque on the border of Spain and France. Let's see, where am I here? Over here. <laughs> this isn't focused very well, so it's kind of hard to see. Uh, Kurdish, which is, of course, spoken in uh, three or four different countries over here. Let's see, I think that it's spoken over here as well as up through here in Iran and Iraq and part of Syria. German in northern Italy. That's a very interesting study, too. The uh, South Tyrolians, who were actually once part of Austria, and then got given by President Wilson to the Italians after the First World War. Or Sorbians in Germany, right up through here. And as you look at this map, you'll see literally dozens of larger countries that have minority speakers within their borders. The situation in relation to the country, where they are, and the languages spoken in that country differs widely from place to place. In the case of Sorbian in Germany, one can say that there is peaceful coexistence and even acceptance and support on the part of the federal, state, and local governments. Also on the part of the German speakers themselves who live there. Most people outside of Germany have never heard of the Sorbs and can't imagine that the significant subculture exists in one of the largest and most powerful nations in Europe. But they are there. Their area is known as Lusatia, or Lausitz in German. A visitor there will see bilingual signs, unusual festive costumes, interesting cultural artifacts, and if you're in the right place at the right time, you will hear the Sorbian language spoken by men and women whose ancestors have spoken it for hundreds of years. Typically, one can speak of two Sorbias and two Sorbian languages. Upper Lusatia, or Oba Lausitz, is down here in the south. Ram Bautzen, comments, 
Hoyerswerda, and Weisswasser. Far to the north, in the area around Cottbus, right up through here, is Lower Lusatia, or Niederlausitz. Now, this can be confusing to those of us who think that north is up and south is down on a map, but it's the topography, not the direction, that gives the name of, of Oberlausitz and Unterlausitz. It's more hilly down here, more mountainous, and quite flat up here as the Spree River spreads out. The languages and cultures are distinct. The separation began, or at least was intensified, by the Reformation. The North became Protestant, while much of the South remained Catholic, but more on that later. The Sorbs can trace their history back to the early part of the 6th century, when most of what is now Eastern Europe was largely uninhabited. Right through here, you see this word, Swarabi. If you look around, you'll see the, uh, uh, the Frankish kingdom over here. Actually, these at the time were under the rule of the Goths and Visigoths. Uh, it's interesting that uh, this area through here is called the Kingdom of Italy and the Goths. <laughs> so you recall from your history, perhaps, that back in those days, there was a lot of, of wandering around. But this area through here is largely uninhabited. And with the exception of the Saxons up here and the Thuringians down through here, there were only a few scatterings of Slavic tribes, among them the Sorbs, living over there. By the beginning of the 8th century, the Franks had established their kingdom. This whole thing all through here. This is going to be what Charlemagne was, was having. And then, of course, the Bavarians and the Alamannics were down here in the southern part. The Saxons were expanding their kingdom over here. And, again, we have the Serbs listed over there in the uninhabited area of, 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 of Europe. By the 10th century, the kingdom of the Franks had been divided, and the eastern part had, been, had conquered the Saxons to the north and was moving further east. So now we have, with the three grandsons of Charlemagne, the division here of what became France, what became Germany, basically, but at this point, in the early 1800s, it was the kingdom of the Franks. Notice that the Saxons had been conquered by them and was now part of that kingdom. But look over here, we still have the Sorbs living over there on the edge, just beyond the Frankish kingdom. Again, as you look down here through other countries, it's interesting to see how things had changed. If you go from map to map to map, it rearranges itself significantly from century to century. I'm actually skipping 200 years at a time, but... Uh, it's quite a change as the civilizations develop. By the 13th century, the Holy Roman Empire had existed for over 200 years and included a small territory known as the March of Lusatia. March here meaning frontier region. It's hard to say, but uh, hard to see, but if you look right up here, that's called the March of Lusatia, which is just above the March of Mycenae. So most of this territory through here was kind of border territory for the Holy Roman Empire, thus the name March, which means it wasn't really incorporated as part of it, or it, it actually was, but it was more on the frontier, the border territory of the kingdom. The Storms have been able to maintain their identity, but were unsuccessful in establishing a political state. And it was during this time especially that they failed to be able to set up their own political kingdom, and therefore they got absorbed by in this case, the, the Franks, the Holy Roman Empire, and so forth. By the 17th century, during the time of the Reformation, it had been divided into Upper and Lower Lusatia. It's kind of hard to see, but over here is, uh, well, here's Lausitz. I'm sorry, I, I, I skipped a century here. Let's go ahead. Over Lausitz and Unter Lausitz, over through here. As I say, it's, it's pretty hard to see with all these sub-kingdoms there because the Holy Roman Empire was subdivided into many, many small kingdoms. A closer look shows that prior to the Thirty Years' War, Upper and Lower Lusatia extended far beyond the Nysa and Oda Rivers to the east and beyond the, I'm sorry, the Nysa and um, Oda Rivers to the east and beyond the Elba to the west. So if we look at this about early 1600, here again is Cottbus, here down here is Bautzen, but this is the modern border between Germany and Poland, and the Sorbs live quite a ways beyond that border. And over here is Dresden, 
and uh, the Elbe River going through here, little pockets of Sorbian speakers all throughout this. I'll show you a map later that shows how diminished that is compared to this time in the 1600s, the time of the Reformation. Uh, here is Frankfurt on the Oda, and up to here, not very far, is Berlin. And so you can see the extent of the territory. And this is kind of reduced from generations before that. So they're kind of getting smaller and smaller as these other states build up. By the end of the 19th century, Lausitz is still there, but it's pretty hard to see. It's right over to here, and there's no special designation for it. You see the kingdom of Saxony here, but this is where the Lusatians are living to there. Today, it has pretty much lost its identity as a separate political entity, and is simply a part of Saxony and Brandenburg. This is a, a modern map, and here's the Federal Republic of Germany with today's borders, and over here is Saxony, and again, this little section through here is where the Sorbians live. By the way, if someone asked me if uh, the Sorbians were related to the Serbians, and the answer is yes, but not very recently. Uh, both names have a connection etymologically, but uh, there's actually no modern relation to it. And I'll talk more about the relationship to other Slavic people in just a minute. Today, the border is not very close to the Oder and Nysa rivers over here, nor to the Oder, I'm sorry, the Oder, uh, yeah, Oder Nysa over here, or the Elba over here. And if you look, you'll see that down here in the south, close to Bautzen, and notice all these bilingual names. This is very typical in the area around here to have two names, one German and one Sorbian. So here's Bautzen down here. Here's Kutlis up here. Notice they aren't even contiguous anymore. And so the small area of lower Lusatia is pretty much cut off and by itself, whereas down here in the south it's a lot larger, a lot more um, noticeable. And yet even the city of Cummins is really on the border over here. And Hoyerswerda is up here even beyond that blue part, which is into the so-called uh, transition area of Lusatia. I'm looking around. I have a student who's from Hoyers about it in one of my classes. I wonder if she came today. I can't see her, but uh, we have someone from, he's from Dresden here, so you understand the, the geography here very well. Lower Lusatia is centered around Kotbus and extends only a small distance to the north, as I mentioned. The most recognizable cultural artifacts relating to the Sorbs is their language. Now, this is a postcard I just bought when I was in Bautzen. It's pretty hard to buy a postcard there without having everything bilingual. In fact, I'll show you in a minute, uh, almost everything has a German name and a Sorbian name. And if you look at those, you can see a relation between the two. And if you're a linguist, you can even see how one developed into the other using the Germanic sound changes throughout the centuries. Virtually every public sign is bilingual. So you get off the train in Bautzen. There's the Bahnhof, but it talks about the Bahnhof Bautzen as well as this, which I won't attempt to pronounce in case someone happens to be here that knows any better. But uh, you'll see again here that this, of course, is the city, uh, I think it's Bushin, and the city for train station. So beginning right there, out on the highway, almost every one of the traffic signs is bilingual. So here's Actually, Dresden and Goritz are not bilingual, but over here, Kostwitz with a Sorbian name, Rosenthal with a Sorbian name, Königswarte with a Sorbian name. And I'm sure it must cost quite a bit of money for the highway department to make all of these signs throughout Saxony and Brandenburg, but you see them everywhere. Here's a street name, Karl Marxstraße. I haven't changed it yet, I guess. But notice the Sorbian name down through here. Here's the Land, uh, Land, uh, Landratsamt in Bautzen. This is one of the uh, official public offices in the city. And again, everything is bilingual. Just a street sign for pedestrians. Schützenplatz, Altstadt, Gedenkstätte, and on and on it goes. Now, a question one has to ask is, is it really necessary? Are there really people who wouldn't be able to find the park if they couldn't read Sorbian? And the answer is no, because virtually all Sorbian speakers are bilingual, Sorbian and German. And yet this is simply a mark of their cultural identity to help people who visit here understand this is a bilingual city. Most of the actual commercial types of signs you might see in stores or on office buildings and so forth are monolingual, only in German. 
unless they have to do somehow with the Sorbian culture. This particular sign is on the house of the Sorbian Institute. You see up here, Zebski Dome. This actually was taken in Kutbus. And by the way, the word Vend and Vendish is also used in the north, in Loa, Lusatia, to refer to the, these people. But this particular word is not a Sorbian word. It's a word from Latin that was given by the Romans to the people that lived here. So you might be able to uh, look at this and with your knowledge of German and Sorbian figure out what all these places are. Actually, they're all part of the Sorbian Institute in Bautzen. Even the cemeteries, this is from the cemetery in Bautzen, you'll find numerous gravestones that are only written in Sorbian because that's the way they want it. There's no need really to have a, a gravestone part German and part Sorbian. And so in the cemetery, which is right in the heart of the city, this old cemetery here, I came across dozens and dozens of gravestones just like this. Anybody able to read that? Anybody here know Czech or Polish? Okay, you can probably read that, can't you? Yeah, it's interesting because uh, there's a very close relationship. They're all Western Slavic languages, and even through all the separation of a, over the generations, there's still a, a close identity. Uh, this is a little harder to read, but the whole thing is in Sorbian. There's no German on there. Serbian speakers do not want for published reading material. The publishing house Domovina edits and publishes a variety of books in the Serbian language, including children's books, academic books, popular science books, literature, and works of Serbian cultural heritage. It also publishes translations from other languages, principally other Slavic languages. Now, again, if you look carefully here, you'll be able to see German books over here on the left. Well, maybe you can't because of the uh, focus. But this is called Zorbische Studien. But most of these books all through here are in the Sorbian language. And the amazing thing is, with such a small population, all of whom are bilingual, but could read German, there's a tremendous amount of resource that put, is put forth to be able to provide for the people books in their own language. This publishing company also publishes a daily newspaper in Upper Sorbian, if you want to read a couple of columns or go ahead while I wait. Notice that the news comes from Mannheim, and I'm not sure where this is over here, but you can pretty well guess Serbsky Novini, the Serbish news. It cost uh, 30 cents or 0.3 euro. This happens to be from the 13th of May when I was there this past year. As well as in a, a weekly newspaper in lower Serbia. I'll come back to these in just a minute. They publish a cultural magazine, a monthly children's magazine, an educational journal, and periodicals of the Catholic and Protestant Sorbs. Radio broadcasting in Sorbian has been in existence for over 50 years, and television is now broadcast every Sunday evening. I read some places something about it's like a, a family home evening. All the family gathers around the television set on Sunday evening and uh, watch the Sorbian broadcast once a week. Written Sorbian goes back to the medieval period. It was especially during the Reformation that works in the Sorbian language began to emerge. The earliest written Sorbian text, which is extant, is the Bautzen Burgers Oath, which dates back to the 15, 1500. A lower Sorbian New Testament appeared in 1548, followed by a hymn book and catechism in 1574. During the age of the Enlightenment, numerous books in both Upper and Lower Sorbian were written and published. I want to go back to the newspapers for just a minute. I this doesn't work, so I've got to You may have noticed that the language in these two newspapers is slightly different. Or maybe you didn't notice it. You probably did, actually. If you look at it, just even up through here This is because linguists are not in agreement as to the, I'm sorry, this is because there's really these two languages, Upper and Lower Sorbian, although linguists are not in agreement as to the extent of difference between the languages. They are, however, considered two languages and not two dialects of the same language. They both belong to the Western Slavic group, along with Polish, Czech, and Slovak. Some say that Upper Sorbian, the one in the south, is more similar to Czech and Lower Sorbian, more similar to Polish, and that would make sense. But it is difficult to really establish this. 
Both languages have a number of borrowed words from German, and both have been very clever in coining new words to express concepts for modern technology and cultural changes. It kind of reminds me of, of Lützeburgish in Luxembourg and Romansch in Switzerland, because these people, again, are also bilingual with German, and often you'll hear people carry on a conversation, kind of a social chit-chat in Lützeburgish, and then suddenly change to German when they begin talking about computers or about psychology or something, because they haven't got the vocabulary in the language to be able to do it. Let's see. Hup. One, two minutes. Just wanted to show you here a list of words, German on the left, or phrases, and then this is Upper Sorbian, and this is Lower Sorbian. So you can see that they're very similar, and yet people that know better say that they're really two different languages that have enough dissimilarity to be considered that. Uh, I was in the National Guard many years ago and took a course in Polish. I remember the greeting was Jem Dobry. If I look up here, it's almost the same as this, just turned around the words. And so if you know German and you want to learn a little bit of Sorbian, then stick around and you can look at that and you can have a good start with that. Um, this brings up the second, I'm, I'm sorry. In Serbia, there are clusters of groups around the geography that all have their unique identities, including how they dress, how they celebrate special days, what they eat, and even how they de decorate their Easter eggs. This brings up the second recognizable cultural artifact of the Sorbs. They love to dress up, <coughs> and they love to decorate. <clears throat> they will don traditional costumes for a variety of occasions. Weddings, funerals, religious holidays, confirmations, special family gatherings, or whenever they feel like it. I'm told that in some villages in Upper Lusatia, one can see women dressed in their festive clothes every day. And they will decorate their homes, their animals, their clothing, fabric, and especially Easter eggs. Just to show you a, a few of these people dressed up, you can pretty well tell this is a wedding. This is a lady who's just out on her bicycle. I, I don't think it's a special day. Now, if you look carefully, you'll see a little decoration over here between her fingers as she's riding on her bicycle. That's just a, a cigar. But uh, she's pretty well dressed up. This is a confirmation. Children coming out of church on a Sunday afternoon after confirmation. But notice, they're not the only ones dressed up. Everyone's dressed up. This is an Easter. Children going back, uh, around to visit grandmother. And the tradition is that she gives them Easter eggs, and then they give her some kind of a present, in this case, something to eat. Notice the basket here again with the eggs in it. But notice how festive they're dressed up. Here's a woman just out standing in the yard. I'm not quite sure if this is a special day or not, but that's a typical costume. And as I mentioned, the costumes differ from region to region within this very small area. This, again, is probably a confirmation day as the children come out of church. I think one of them is Catholic and one of them is Protestant. This is a woman that I met when I was in Bautzen. She runs a restaurant, a Sorbian restaurant, and she dresses up every day just like this. And the windows in the back here represent various themes from culture, uh, Sorbian culture. The food she serves is authentic Sorbian. I ate dinner there. But uh, all throughout the restaurant, you'll see these artifacts that reflect the culture. <clears throat> I happened to be in Bautzen the day they celebrated their thousandth anniversary. And as a result, all the Serbs came from miles around in their little groups and performed. This was an outside stage. This just happens to be one musical group here that's up there dancing and singing, playing instruments. Here's another one. Uh, women in various types of clothing. And these men are not holding sheep. They're holding a musical instrument, very much like the uh, bagpipe. It's called the Schaff um, uh, Dudelsack. And they're actually things made out of an old, uh, made out of a once sheep. They just cut the legs off, clean it out, and then put the instrument inside, and then they play it on their fingers here, and, and it sounds terrible. I mean, it really is awful. <laughs> Notice the sign down here. If you know Czech or Polish or German, this is a big thing. They want to make a, a case of this. <clears throat> Die Lausitz ist zweisprachig. Lusatia is bilingual. And this is why there's so much obvious presence of language around there, because they want to maintain it. They want to have people understand that. I got a few shots at Easter eggs. I was told that there are five different methods 
of doing Easter eggs in Lusatia, all representing different groups, originally different families. If you look carefully here, these are real eggs <clears throat> that have been emptied out and then decorated in a fine way. <clears throat> they etch them. They carve. They don't carve them, but they they, uh, they uh, scribble on them. They use a wax method. They use just plain paint method. But you can see how colorful they are. And if you go into the Cultural Institute there in Bautzen, you can buy these by the dozen. That's not true, actually, because Germans sell eggs by 10, not by 12. It's a decimal system. But you can buy them in cartons and just take them home. I brought back about, what, 15, 20 eggs, I believe, or quite a few. These are goose eggs here and hen eggs. And it happens every Easter. It's a big thing. Another example there. Although many Serbs attend German schools, there is a comprehensive Serbian language education system in Lusatia. The Saxony Education Act of 1991 assures the legal right to the teaching of Serbian and the teaching of other subjects in Serbian. In addition, history and culture of the Serbs is a compulsory subject throughout all Saxony. Do you have to learn about Serbish in your school? About them, yes. Good. So that the people in Saxony and Brandenburg have to learn at least a little bit about the Serbs. In Upper Lusatia, Serbian is the main language of instruction at six primary schools and six secondary schools. Usually, mathematics and the sciences are taught in German, mainly because of the numerous technical terms. This actually goes back to the, uh, the uh, German Democratic Republic, when they were concerned that some of the Serbian children were falling behind in their math and science, and so they decided to have those taught only in German. The Domovina Publishing House has made available over 170 school textbook titles, in Serbian for all required subjects. In approximately 75 schools in Saxony and Brandenburg outside the Lusatian area, Serbian is taught as a foreign language to native speakers of German who wish to take it. At present, there are 10 Serbian nursery schools, mainly in Upper Lusatia, attended by about 600 children of preschool age. Some of these schools are attended by the German-speaking children whose parents want their children to become bilingual. In addition, there are 21 bilingual nursery schools in the Bautzen, Comments, Hoyosveta Triangle, in which both Serbian and German are used. About 900 children attend these schools. By the way, this uh, city called Comments is the birthplace of Lessing, if you know German literature. And I'm sure that Lessing must have some Serbian ancestry in his line as well. There are no Serbian institutions of higher learning, which may give rise to the question, where are the teachers of the Serbian schools educated? At the University of Leipzig, an Institute of Serbian Studies was established in 1951 for this purpose. Here, native Serbian speakers can train and complete their education to become teachers. Classes in Serbian literature, teaching methodology, and the Serbian language are available. Non-Serbian speakers can also study Serbian languages and culture at Leipzig, which has the most extensive collection of Serbian language materials in the world. Serbian cultural institutes are also located in Bautzen and Cottbus, but we do not offer degree programs. How much longer will the language and culture of this small group of people be able to continue? Even the most optimistic sociologists and linguists see an end coming to this 1,500-year-old culture, at least the active use of the language. I'm reminded of languages like Cornish and Manx. Uh, you can actually date the day that they became extinct because a woman died on that particular day and she was the last speaker of Manx or Cornish or whatever. A lot of languages, once spoken in Europe, have now died out. It's hard to say how long it will last. Unlike the older order Amish or the Hutterites in the United States, who are held together by a very strong religious tradition and a rejection of the outside world, the Sorbs, although also strongly religious, especially among the Catholics, are rapidly becoming integrated into modern German society. There is an increasing number of mixed marriages, in which case the children invariably learn German and shun Sorbish. And because of the economic hardship in Saxony and Brandenburg, many younger Serbs are leaving Lusatia and moving west, where they have no real opportunity to use their native language. Without continuing subsidies from the federal, state, and local governments, much of the cultural infrastructure in Lusatia, the schools, the radio, the television broadcasts, publications, would collapse. Unemployment among Serbian families is higher than, in other, than others in Saxony and Brandenburg. And families are often forced to move from their rural areas to the urban areas to be able to survive. The assimilation is especially advanced in the north, around Cottbus. 
Not only are there no monolingual Sorbian speakers here, but increasingly fewer bilingual speakers. I was surprised when I visited the Sorbian Cultural Institute in Kotlis last May to learn that none of the employees there could speak Sorbian or understand it. We just work here, they said. Nor could they tell me much about the extent to which Sorbian is spoken in Lower Lusatia. In the Sorbian Cultural Institute in Bautzen, on the other hand, one hears Sorbian spoken everywhere by the employees as well as many visitors. The Sorbs have been persecuted or ignored for many generations by the Nazis and communists as well as governments before them. In 1997, the German Federal Parliament passed the law on the Framework Convention of the Council of Europe for the Protection of National Minorities. Through this legislation, and additional legislation passed in 1998, Upper and Lower Serbia have become, by law, recognized, protected, and promoted minority languages. The states of Saxony and Brandenburg in 1992 guaranteed the rights of Sorbs to protection, preservation, and promotion of their national identity and language. The Sorbs are a resilient people. Like Romansh and Switzerland, they are fiercely proud of their heritage and culture. They are willing to sacrifice to maintain their way of life. Not everyone is moving to the West, or to Bautzen, Hoyerswerda, or Cottbus. The culture will remain for generations as the people, especially in rural areas, dress up for festive occasions and decorate eggs every Easter. One remnant of the Sorbs that will remain indefinitely are the numerous place names throughout this area, including Bautzen, Kotbus, Leipzig, and Dresden. These are all, they all go back to Sorbian place names originally. The people of Upper and Lower Lusatia are a wonderful cultural gem in the beautiful Spray Valley and Forest. I look forward to going back and enjoying the beauties and wonders of these fascinating people and hope that my children and grandchildren will be able to do the same. Thank you. Yeah, there's time for questions, it looks like, if you're interested to have any questions. Yes. I don't know. I didn't have a chance to really talk to them about that. The, the Sorbs, for the most part, are not terribly political people anyway. They kind of mind their own business and state of themselves. But I'm sure that they do have ideas and they express them to each other. But I, I just don't know. Couldn't tell you. Uh, one back here. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, Sorb is generally the people themselves. Sorbian is the language. But Sorbian can also be an adjective referring to the whole area, the Sorbian culture, the Sorbian people, and so forth. Well, as I mentioned earlier, they are, but not for not very recently. The words themselves, according to my colleagues in, in Russian, say that they are the same. But uh, what the relationship is historically, I just don't know. But there's, there's no... <clears throat> No recent historical relationship between the Serbs and the Sorbs, as far as I know. Other questions? Okay, well, I let you out early for lunch. Good. Thank you.